and good evening and welcome to this Audio Engineering Society online webinar. We all watch TV, the flickering screen in, in every home. We're all very familiar with the issues of picture quality from grainy black and white on a tiny screen to today's mammoth 8, 8K 85 inch super duper ultra HD models. But what we hear less of, sometimes literally, are the loudspeakers. In tonight's talk, Casper Anderson will describe some of the innovations in TV loudspeaker technology that are coming to our living rooms. This presentation will explain some of the ideas, methods and engineering that goes into obtaining great sound in modern TVs. We will walk along the sound tuning journey from system design, measurement acquisition, blind testing, to sound quality predictions and automation of the sound tuning process. Casper is a senior acoustic engineer at Roku's Aarhus Denmark office. He is responsible for the acoustic design of Roku's audio products from TV streams, from, from TVs to stream bars and wireless speakers. Previously, he held positions at Hansong, Dyna Audio and Bukart Audio. He has a degree in electrical and electronic engineering from Aarhus University. So Casper's talk will begin in a moment and will take us up towards eight o'clock. He is happy to answer any questions you have. So feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. Uh, you can, that's better than putting them in the chat, then we can keep an eye on them. <laughs> After the talk, there'll be a Zoom meeting room where Casper will be, will be available to take questions. The link to that meeting is in the reminder email that was sent out earlier, so please click that link after this talk to join in. I'll also copy that, chat, in, that link into the chat as we go through the talk, so if, if you've forgotten where that email is, don't worry. And as I said, this is a joint event with the Institution of Engineering and Technology Cambridge Local Network. I'd like to welcome both AES and IET members across the world to this evening's webinar. And now that's enough for me, it's time to hand over to Casper. Thanks, Neil. I'll open my slideshow here. Here we go. <clears throat> so I'm Casper Anderson. Um, as Neil told, I'm working for the Danish department of Roku. It's located in Aarhus and there's a small picture of the entrance of where we stay. Today, we will go through basic system design and qual sound quality predictions. What kind of considerations do you need to make early on when you make systems? We'll go to objective modeling and measurement acquisition. So this is about um, the objective measurements. What kind of meaningful parameters can we take pull out of it? The blind listening testing, which is the soft side, like the receiving end, and how do we kind of optimize and scale this process? So, so the first system design, um, again, we need, we, we need a, an ability to predict. We need to, to model preference. Um, the second one, we need to acquire relevant knowledge about what we are building. So this is like the engineering side of things. It's measurements. It's weighing things, quantifying things, and putting that data into models. The blind listening testing is they kind of necessary because um, we need to hit the preference of a customer. And there is no other way to figure out what kind of sound we should make than actually um, setting the goal to, to the customer's preference. Um, and again, implementing these findings um, and trying to optimize the sound quality in, in an efficient manner. So what we're trying to work towards here is um, like an, a very efficient and scalable process where uh, optimally we would have a loudspeaker model. We would put in initial parameters like some, some things some we already know about it and some things are fixed and some of the parameters may be guesses. Um, we 
we have a perceptual model that kind of like takes the loudspeaker model and predicts how well would it do? Like what kind of preference rating would this system get if we were to make a blind listening test on it? And the, the score can come out of this process and, and maybe it wasn't quite what you had hoped. So you will feed that back like as an kind of like an error signal. It's almost negative feedback. You will try to change the parameters and go through the loop again until the score has kind of like reached some kind of maximum. Um, so the system design and maximizing output, that's the, that's the very first step. Usually one of the important things to get right is, is getting the maximum output, especially base performance right in a loudspeaker. Much of the price and size uh, determines what you can achieve here. So we're looking into driver design, driver optimization, and again, like cost is always relevant. Enclosure design and, and, and how do we predict how well active loudspeakers will do? Um, when you're looking at max output, voice call optimization becomes a thing. Um, you can kind of like score the max output and you can also make sure that you tune the speaker in a way that it's always exploiting its capabilities. So you're always using its maximum output. So if we take like a very simple example here, this is uh, if you take a, a piston with a surface area of 100 square centimeter and it's moving, like it has a displacement of 10 millimeters. Um, it's dropping off um, in output towards lower frequency. So you have kind of like this 12 dB um, per octave fall off. That's just like the output from this piston if, if it moved 10 millimeters at all frequencies. So, so most loudspeakers are like this. They have, <clears throat> they have an upper limit for, for displacement. That's usually the limit you will hit first. It's like the loudspeaker becomes too nonlinear or it will damage itself if you, if you exceed this limit. So you have to stay below it. And when you kind of get this limit, you, you, you get the, this line to the, to the left. Like this is a very simplified way of thinking of it. But if, if you're talking about base output, you're often talking about like, where is the minus 6 dB point or 3 dB point or what kind of reference you wanna use. Where, when does it start to fall off? And, and with an act, active loudspeaker, you can actually pretty much decide where do you want it to fall off, but, but you, can, it, you can never squeeze out more output than like you can physically achieve with this. So this would be like the maximum output curve for a very, very, very simple driver, which is just a piston. So we, if we take it a step further here, and, and this is based on a lump model of a loudspeaker, and we also know something about the enclosure, and we know something about the loud, uh, about the amplifier. Then the curve starts to kind of like um, fall off towards high frequencies, or at least stabilize too. Um, what we're seeing here is, is a driver uh, with a max uh, displacement of eight millimeters and we are driving it with an am amplifier that has a voltage capability of 20 volts. Um, at the very low frequencies, you can see we kind of like hit that very theoretical limit. We hit that, um, that same curve that the piston would have this 12 dB per octave fall off. That's where you kind of like say you can't you can go higher than the eight millimeters than the driver can do. When we go to higher frequencies, because the, the requirement for excursion at higher frequencies gets lower, like it's not, the, the, the driver goes from being displacement or excursion limited to being voltage limited. Then we hit the amplifier limit and, and the dis displacement of the driver is actually much lower. We can kind of exploit this knowledge and we can, we can also do an optimization of the drivers. So, so in terms of getting this curve, we're interested in getting like the absolute maximum displacement reach with this amplifier. Sometimes it could be a compromise between ability to move and um, efficiency. Usually you, if you want a driver with let's say more excursion capability, um, you will have to add mass because the voice call will be longer and that will take down the sensitivity or the efficiency of the driver. So depending on your amplifier, you will maybe lose or, or gain output in a system. 
So you always need to balance these things to kind of like get the maximum output. And that's where we like do customization of all drivers that go into our products. And this is an example of how you can kind of like optimize a voice coil. Uh, you can optimize the length material, windings, LE, RE, uh, to kind of like, let's just set you, 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 you put the criteria of like, we want maximum output below 100 Hertz. You can, you can actually kind of like dial in the parameters of a driver to be just perfect for, for that kind of uh, setup. So I think you can, you can always find a bit of extra, um, power and efficiency in these system by designing them very right like and and that's where you can you can cut some cost because you don't necessarily have to get a more expensive driver you just have to like really make the part fits together and and you can find a little bit extra there again if we go back to like um we want of course a system that is designed for maximum output but we also want to exploit it so that this has been an issue with passive loudspeakers for many years. Passive loudspeakers um, kind of like end up with a fixed frequency response. Um, and, and the design of the loudspeaker will make a compromise between max SPL and how much bass capability do you want. And, and usually the, the deeper, like the, the lower you want the bass to go, um, the the more you you kind of like sacrifice the the max SPL of the system. So um, if you you if you build a loudspeaker to go very low and you you're not making it the size of a fridge with huge drivers, so it's actually capable of holding that level up to to quite quite high uh, output. Um, it will probably go into like you you will drive it into a nonlinear area where it can damage itself or it would just distort way too much. Uh, and the other way, if you if you just like design it to have maximum output, maybe it will never really play bass, and uh, you would have to play very very high to actually like fully exploit the driver. But with active loudspeakers, we have the luxury that we can kind of like just have an adaptive frequency response. We can we can change this on the fly, and we can if we are if we are predicting how how much overload do we have on the driver? Like like would the driver overload if we send in this signal? Well, then we can slightly adjust the signal, or we can adjust some filters so we know that we will just stay below the limit. So the if we look at the plot to the to the very left, we can kind of like see we have an input signal that goes up and down and level and changes frequency. And the output signal kind of like changes uh, excursion here. We, we, we have a step up and step down and so on. And in the middle pr plot, we can kind of like see if, if the driver were unprotected, like we have no regulation of this, well, they, they um, excretion of the dryer would pretty much just follow follow the input signal. When you go to a lower frequency, it will go up. If you increase the level, it will go up. But with the protected algorithm and these adaptive filters that can change real time, we can actually keep the excretion constant. And that's really interesting because then we are fully exploiting the driver at all times. So we are using the loudspeaker's full potential at all levels. So even if you play low, the loudspeaker would, like if you play at a low, some pressure level, the loudspeaker would be able to play very low bass. And the same if, if, if you go to a very high level, the loudspeaker will ad adapt to that and, and, and limit the bass a little bit so it, it wouldn't be driven out in, in distortion or may, maybe even damaging uh, parts of it. So this again is, is like an example of how the filters can, can move like the system will figure out a protection frequency, select the, the right filter and, and attenuate. So, so the loudspeaker always is, is on the limit and it's fully exploited. That brings us to the, to the next point, which is like objective modeling and measurement acquisition. We have some measurement facilities in Denmark. We have uh, we have a, a clipple near field scanner in San Jose. We have a, a semi anechoic basement, uh, anechoic chamber there, and um, 
We have some computer assisted uh, tuning tools, uh, tools we build ourselves, software packages to, to take in these measurements and analyze them. And then I have an example of a Roku wireless uh, speaker. So this is, uh, this is a couple of pictures of the lab we have in, in all hooks in Denmark. Uh, this is the basement to the, to the left we're showing uh, uh, Roku um, stream bar and to the right we have uh, TV we're testing. This is kind of the output we're getting from the Clipple NFS measurement method. So Clipple is building uh, a model uh, from, from this near field scan it's doing. This is the this is the lab in uh, San Jose and Francisco. So um, this is really useful when we want to measure products that would maybe be towards a wall or on a stand and see like how would that affect the directivity with the sound change? What do, what does it mean for the TV if it's not measured uh, free field? Some of these effects are quite predictable in in the low end, like in the base and 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 mid range. It's you can you can kind of calculate it, but but when you get towards the higher frequencies, these these effects can be difficult to to calculate. So it's it's nice to be able to measure it. So these measurements go into our custom made simulation system. We will take out uh, meaningful variables um, here on this plot. We're kind of like showing the good old school on axis, listening window, sound power, directivity index, um, variables like that. And these computer assisted tools can optimize these variables. So if we look at, at this, this is an example of, of a Roku um, wireless speaker, and you can see it have quite a, a nice response in, in on axis and in the listening window, the sound power is also very smooth and even, and it has a smooth, uh, pretty constant directivity index too. And like this is this is some of the parameters we are looking into when we're optimizing these designs. It's it's the most obvious, and I think these are are pretty pretty well known. So some of the other things that we have been looking into is um, these these few variables uh, didn't quite explain the um, what we were seeing in the listening test. We had to add some some extra things. So we. We, we're trying to build this um, multilinear regression so we can explain what is going on in, in the listening test um, with the objective data. And um, what, one of the things we, we found, like we have, a, we have many variables that are explaining this, but, but I think one of the interesting findings we kind of took away is uh, if you look at these very traditional curves for uh, listening windows, sound power, or maybe even early reflections, is that um, it's all kind of spatial averages. In, in, in this case, uh, the data comes from the Clippo NFS uh, measurement and just inside of the listening uh, window, we have hundreds of points where we are kind of like taking a power uh, average of these. And what happens when you, when you power average uh, these measurement points to, to like cover a big listening window? So the listening window is, uh, is quite big. It's, 30 to 30 degrees and 15 up and down. So it's, it would like cover uh, a full family and in, in their sofas and so on. What, what, what happens when you take the average of that whole uh, piece is that if, if the loudspeaker has a lot of interference, it, it kind of get averaged out because uh, interference kind of like have a, a bit of a random uh, nature and it's, it's dependent on position. So it's like spatially dependent. So when you, when you average all these things, it, it, it tends to, to average out. So these very traditional um, curves that are basically averages uh, don't quite tell the, the full story. At least we, we don't get a, a high level of explanation when we just use those. Um, so one of the things is also like we can usually, like if, if you just uh, use filters, you can pretty much EQ these target curves to like what you want if if you if you're okay with with like pretty complicated filters but you can never 
EQ the like the spatial various variance uh, away because um, it's it's spatial like it's it's three dimensional so if you push one one place it pokes up in, a, in another place so so one of the things we kind of like had to to uh, to add was like um, spatial variance we had to have a me measurement for this because as as you can see like the we have a, a, a high quality loudspeaker here with a very nice response. And, and we have a, a TV here where like it's it's in another budget and it's under some other circumstances. But the, if you look at the, the frequency response, it can still be EQ'd quite flat. Um, but one thing we, we, we can't really change is the spatial variance around this. Um, so we kind of had to add a variable to, to the regression to, to explain what was going on. Next step is blind listening testing. And we have some facilities in Denmark. This is a, this is a listening lab in, in Denmark. We, we build our own software tool. It's a, it's a Musra style tool. Um, and we run listening test where we we not only like of course we look at, at how how do the projects do the products do but we also kind of like look at how how do the listeners do in in terms of consistency and ability to discriminate so we have f scores um and we are starting to build like quite a quite a big database of um of points for for different products we're adding more and more products and one more listeners to this database. This is uh, one of the setups where we are kind of like trying to uh, measure many different products together. And, and, and this, this was kind of difficult because if you're just measuring one category of, of products, it's, it's easier to dial down like what's, what's important and, and what would you expect. But when, when you mix it all up and, and put in different types of products and mixed TV soundbars with loudspeakers and they would have very different directivity. It's, uh, you, the, the model becomes uh, much more complicated. Like we, we get more dimensions to be able to, to predict what's, what's going on. For example, the TVs are usually, usually have like downward facing uh, drivers. So the TV would in nature have a directivity index close to zero dB. So it's, it's, energizing the, move, the room more than a forward firing loudspeaker. Um, and, and that alone, like, like how, how, how do we explain that, that, that like maybe that's a part of the preference. Um, it actually seemed so that, that some listeners kind of like like that very low directivity, even though uh, the sound was corrupted in many other ways. So that was interesting. Um, this also serves to kind of like build um, the left side of this equation. So um, we have all the, the scores from, from different products and like each of these products down here, we also have all the objective variables for. So we're kind of like setting up uh, this like uh, big matrix of, uh, of data and, and, and solving it to figure out what kind of uh, what kind of model uh, do we need to explain what's going on in the listening test? So the listening test is, is uh, going into to this equation. And it's, um, it's based in like, we have this, again, very objective domain, the, the domain we started looking into with measurements and extracting variables. And in, in the other side with the listening test, we have this very perceptual domain and in between we, we have some psychoacoustics that maybe try to explain what is the connection between these two domains, but like we needed to, to, to link it more tightly. And um, I actually think we like it's it's still a very small and very simple data set we have, but 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 even with that, we could we could kind of like get a, a pretty good um, prediction. And as you see here, we we kind of like got an uh, R squared of 83%. Um, and of course, we have we have errors in the prediction, um, but at this point, it's it's pretty close to what we're seeing in the listening tests. So the the goal of this was like let's let's link the objective domain to the perceptual domain with a model, and then that brings us to kind of like the the last step, 
um, with this model, can we can we scale? Can we do some automation? Can we like what what do we do with this knowledge? And this is this is the dilemma we were looking at in the beginning that um, the the domain that we are trying to hit into is their perceptual domain, but like we. We are working as engineers, we're working in the objective domain and um, hitting exactly into the perceptual domain and hitting someone's like a customer's preference is, is difficult and you can't really see the like the goal clearly or the like the apparent position of the, the fish is distorted compared to like you may think that you know how to hit it, but but you may not hit it like it, it may be somewhere else than you think. So um, again, it's putting putting the model in so we can actually get to that fish. So if, if we look at the traditional kind of like development process for a, a, an audio product, it would be we have this loudspeaker prototype or like we have some something initial that we came up with that we think this, this is a good beginning point. And um, we will evaluate that with blind listening tests like it's it's the like as, as at least we think it's is the only reliable um, way to 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 do like a perceptual test that has to be blind. Um, it's it's just there's there's too much uh, room for error if it's if it's not blind. It's 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 risky. Um, but the the problem about this is like blind listening tests. Um, are quite difficult. They take a lot of time to set up. They're quite expensive to run. They, they slow down the process a lot. If, and if you need to, to do this iteration where you need to change something in your loudspeaker prototype, it, it may be mechanical, it may be acoustical, electronics, drivers, filters, uh, you need to do a change in the tuning. Like every iteration you want to do, you, you pretty much like need to confirm that it actually did improve the loudspeaker and so if you have to run a blind listening test every time you change something it it becomes extremely time consuming especially if you want to do many products so um this this is not great um so if we can get to a perceptual model um this becomes a fast scalable process because with with a perceptual model uh, this can effectively run on a computer. Like some of the parameters may just be filter parameters, setup parameters. It may be optimization of a driver, and maybe we can put that on a model too. And and this loop can can actually run very fast, and and the score would basically become an optimization problem. So if you want to take this even further, like how how do we opt how do we also make this even more? How do we get the base performance just right? Um, we've looked into self-identification. What if the system could figure out like, uh, what am I, what can I do? Uh, what kind of protection systems do I need? Like if I, I should set up a thermal model and a displacement model, how do I do that? How do I figure out how the compressors and limiters should be set up? And again, like how, how do we hit the preference uh, of customers if we're talking about like uh, how should the balance of the loudspeaker be how should the eq target be we can we can generate uh, eq filters um, just from like a preference optimization figure out what is the very right filter coefficients that will give the maximum score for the speaker so we um, we have this prototype. It's again a, a Roku wireless speaker. Uh, we added a voltage and current probe uh, on the top of it, quite obviously, and we have a, a microphone um, for an additional probe, uh, an additional piece of information. Um, additional problems that we kind of like solve with this is like they use mechanical components that can change they may even fail due to fatigue aging temperature quality uh, we have variation in production usually if you want very low variation like you want very low tolerances it's associated with increased cost so if you can if you can um if you can handle more variation in your production you can reduce the cost um, 
And sometimes the loudspeakers are used in unknown or even changing conditions. It could be uh, gaskets starting to leaking, something like that, temperatures change, humidity, many factors. So we have this concept where we kind of like have um, the loudspeaker model, we have a correction model, we have an amplifier and a loudspeaker and the system model, and we have this voltage and current feedback, and we can constantly uh, self-identify. So we will just be fitting a model to the loudspeaker. Uh, so we can self-tune many of the uh, setup parameters. We can self-diagnose if like something should be wrong with the loudspeaker. We can simplify maybe even speed up production like test, stabilize performance over lifetime, and we can increase efficiency of them. I have, let's see if this works. I have a small video of this uh, running. It, this is uh, my desk in, in Aarhus in Denmark, and this is like a very early implementation, and I'm, I'm running it um, from MATLAB on this prototype. Let's see if the video plays. This was a, a chirp going through the loudspeaker, and the loudspeaker was like fully identified with uh, quite low fitting error of like below 2%. Oops. I don't know. Just find it again. Okay. Yes, so this is another application um, just to kind of like show the, the power and the, of this and, and the many applications you can have. So we tried to drill a, a hole in this loudspeaker um, to just see like would, would the model actually figure this out. So drilling a hole and, and just let it re-identify re or like um, we, can, we can see we have the electrical systems down to the left and to the right, we have the mechanical system and the mechanical system is, is just the mass a spring and we have some losses and the RMS is like the mechanical losses in the system. And we can see like even, even with a, a small one millimeter hole, the, the losses increase with two millimeter, they, it increases 10% and with three millimeter, it increases a lot. And also the spring loosens up slightly when we do this. It, it seems like the, the springiness of the air decreases a little bit and that, that makes perfectly sense. So like we have a, a very clear um, impact on the mechanical model uh, that makes a lot of sense to kind of like the, the change we just introduced. And here you can see in the lump model that it's the RM parameter it's the mechanical loss that kind of like increased a lot so like to to reveal this change in the system so um this is kind of wrapping it up um when we have this model of the loudspeaker we can self-identify we can figure out what is the optimal iq we can we can put it on a cost function we can pretty much just optimize the, the equation we were building before and see like how can we maximize the, the score of, of that function, like the output of that function. And we can, we can run it in a loop down here and bring down the, the, the error, in, optimize the, the equation and tuning suddenly turned into an optimization problem. So this was, methods to acquire accurate objective measurements. And again, methods to acquire accurate subjective measurements of press preference, tools to analyze and extract meaningful parameters from it and methods to kind of like map this objective data to the subjective preference ratings. And last, uh, established like a scalable process to how to set up tune loudspeakers and TVs. So that was, all I had. Thanks. Well, thank you, Casper. That was a brilliant talk. Covered a lot of information there. Um, we've got quite a few questions. Um, 
typical IT um, shenanigans. <laughs> I think all the IET um, members have joined us, all answering to the name David Blake, um, which kind of reminiscent of um, uh, uh, um, which is going to confuse things a little bit. But anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, so yeah, so um, we'll go through the the questions in a moment. I've just posted the link to the Q and A Zoom after this into the chat. So um, if you don't have the email, please just make a note of that, and we'll we'll go there after we've gone through all the questions and uh, said thank you to Casper. Um, but first of all, let's just go through some of the questions that have been posted into the Q and A, uh, and then and and we can. Casper can answer those live. So, so J Jamie Angus from the AES has asked, um, is the graph of output versus displacement for a piston in an infinite baffle? Um, I actually think the plot I showed was uh, what you call uh, four pi or like um, free, free standing. Um, but the difference is really just like shifting at um, 60 B. So, um, I, I guess the, the point would work for both three field or half field. Okay, um, uh, anonymous attendee is asking what SPL is. Um, I think that's sound pressure level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, just a quick admin item uh, posted into the chat. You can, if you go onto your um, tile, you click on the three dots, you can change your name to something other than David Blake. Otherwise, poor David, who, who I know personally is, is is going to be blamed for a lot of a lot of things. <laughs> um, so one of the many Davis is asking uh, if if you have tried capacitive loudspeakers. No, I have not. I'm I'm not quite sure. Maybe maybe uh, he can um, expand a little bit on this. Uh, what 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 does he mean with the capacitive loudspeakers? I'm I'm, I'm guessing things like. Pizza or um, electrostatic speakers, anything other than oh yeah, other other transducer or... types. I've I've mostly worked with electrodynamic loudspeakers. Um, I've worked quite a bit with waveguides too and compression drivers. I I do not have much experience with uh, piezoelectric or electrostatic loudspeakers. No. Okay. Um, another question from Jamie. Um, an interesting use of spherical harmonics. Uh, could you revisit that slide and give the references, please? Um, I, yeah, I guess we can open it up. Um, there is some references. Like this is this is uh, basically just a reference to um, Klippel's measurement system, and Klippel uses this uh, spherical harmonic. Um, model to to generate the far field output when they have kind of like acquired the near field output but yeah i can i can do a quick screen share of that one it's right here i can now it disappeared for me can yes. you guys see this yeah if you go to the specific slide and i think it's shifting yeah, it's 21 yeah it's this one i, I guess yeah. Yeah, we have references by like nine, 1980, Lagrange, around 2009. This 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 figure is 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 just from the from the Clipple near field scanner method. Uh, so that's okay. Okay. Um, another some questions from other IET members. Um, how does the speaker enclosure affect the loudspeaker performance? Many TVs have a very low volume, a very, I'm, I'm guessing sort of spatial volume available to the loudspeaker. Yeah, so um, usually when you lower the volume, um, you, don't, you don't change the maximum output capability of the driver because that again is, is is mainly its ability to move. Like, so, so we're back at the very basics piston, like it's, it's displacement again, but you kind of like do tighten the spring in, in the mechanical model. So what happens is you need more power to, to get the same displacement. And, and that 
can of course cause a, a number of new problems. So you would maybe deal with um, increased thermal compression, maybe even like thermal overload. Um, you can also get many other funny nonlinear uh, things going on when you have very small uh, cavities. Uh, the spring itself may not be completely linear. Okay. Um, another question from an IET member. What is the directivity index? Is it as simple as how well the listener can perceive where the sound is coming from? Okay, so so in this case, the directivity index is the relationship between the forward going uh, sound and the sound power. So imagine that the loudspeaker sends sound in all directions. And then you kind of like look at how much of the sound is going forward, like how much of the sound is in the listening window compared to all the, the, the other. So it's it's the ratio and you usually display it in dB. Most, most typical consumer forward firing loudspeakers would have like an average, if, if you take like frequency rated uh, um, index would, would be like around 6 dB, which, which means like pretty much twice the energy is going forward compared to the energy that is going in all other directions. Where because of like when you have TVs that are pretty much just pointing down, um, the directivity index turns to, to zero because then it's symmetrical on the horizontal axis. It's the same all the way around. Thank you. Um, and another question from an IET member. Um, they've noticed over the years it is increasingly difficult to separate dialogue audio from background music and effects to the extent that they mostly watch dramas with the subtitles on. Um, is this due to audio engineering of source material, too much compression, or poor quality speakers on modern TVs? I, th I think it's a mix. We, you can definitely, um, you can find material where it's very uh, difficult to hear the dialogue on even good speakers. Uh, but, but a part of it is, is also in the speakers, I would say. Like, like we've, we've, we've looked into this a, a lot. It's, it's a very important thing for us with, this, with voice clarity and intelligibility. So, um, there are ways to to get around this and 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 like design like from early stages for better uh, voice clarity but you can also help it a lot with um, algorithms like post processing we have um we've introduced like an auto speech clarity function recently uh, which is a, a function that that with deep learning detects speech and only enhances that part so you don't kind of like get filters um, on your response if you're just listening to music or like let's say other scenes and movies okay um all right just catch up with uh jamie likes your uh, your fish in water analogy <laughs> um jamie. And another it member asking um have any alternative loudspeaker technologies been considered other than the um, electromagnetic so i think that touches on a question earlier but oh yeah yeah I, in, in terms of your work now yeah so so um we haven't looked much into that but like you 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 see people looking into all kind of um alternative technologies all the time like you'll even see the like a uh, spark plug kind of loudspeakers that will uh, heat up air so so quickly that that like you can you can oscillate the air with that. You can see you can see people working on these very thin um, carbon fibers that are so thin that they don't have like a, a mechanical inertia of temperature. So that you can kind of like change change the temperature on them pretty much um, instantly and use them. And like you'll see these this technology in in muscles like like artificial muscles also using used for loudspeakers there's all kind of inventions but but like this electrodynamic loudspeaker it's it's existed for like 100 years and and it's far recent like it's it's been through a lot of tests and a lot of other technologies have tried to take in its its place but it just haven't happened yet and i think it's like when it when it comes to its ability to create volume displacement it's it's still unmatched. Okay. Um, Jamie is asking about the uh, spherical harmonics uh, was in the acoustic parameters slide. 
Um, perhaps you could um, unpack that slide a bit more. Um, yeah, that was in the. It's the same one that we showed earlier. Uh, possibly. Um, I can bring it up again. Um, this one. So. Um, yeah, so so what's going on here? Like uh, this is this is uh, what's going on. We we're using Clipple uh, NFS to to acquire these measurements, and what Clipple is doing here is. Uh, oh, you can join. So if you, I think if you do Shift F five, then it will show just that that slide. Oh, and then it goes to the start. I'll roll down to it. Yeah. Um, boom, boom, boom. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what Clip is trying to do here is uh, fit um, the spherical model, uh, pretty much figure out what, what kind of coefficients do we need in this model to predict uh, or to like match, to fit the, the output in the near field of, of this uh, model. So it, um, it, usually the, the, the robot would take around like 500 to 1,000 measurements um, in a cylinder shape around the sound source and it's it's doing it quite close uh, so it's it's a near field measurement and um so it, it it got a lot of measurements for reference and and then you're trying to optimize this model like can we can we find a coefficient for monopole for dipole like at each frequency that can kind of like explain this sound field and and if you're able to fit this model to uh, your measurement um with like a low enough error, you can then take the model and you can predict the sound pressure level in any distance, any angle. So then you kind of like, you can, you can extract, um, let's say any, any spherical data set, which you usually do. Like, like from this model, we would usually uh, export uh, a sphere of points. So these points would have a, a distance of around five degrees. And for, for that, you get like 2,700 points. We would take that out. And, and that, that would kind of like be the data set, like a far field spherical surface that we then run uh, all our analysis on and we extract these uh, parameters from. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mike Martindale uh, from, the I, uh, from the IET, um, Group. Um, presumably, you are using a class D power amplifier. Are there not problems with effective damping of the drive unit with the class D amp because of the significant impedance of its output EMC filter? Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a classic one. Um, I'm I'm not sure if uh, if damping factor is 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 that important um, because if you look in, in in the loudspeaker itself, like you you also have a lot of um, resistance in the voice coil itself, and and like there's just a practical limit to how much damping you can actually get, and you can also use the argument like like many people like these uh, classic uh, tube amps with pretty much a trefoil in the in the output with like high uh, high resistance like that's it's it's of course it, it affects the sound because you're pretty much putting a, a resistor in, in series with your loudspeaker which you like in most cases wouldn't be interested in doing but you can still get away with doing it like like pretty successfully um yeah okay and uh, and uh, a, a follow-up question to that um is that Traditional hi-fi design tries to minimize the stuff between the source and the loudspeaker, whereas your talk has lots of active components between the two. Why? Um, yeah, so um, that that's an idea that, that let's say you have some um, pure sound, you have something that you would be able to reproduce perfectly if you just kind of like get the loudspeaker perfect, like you would you would get close to the, let's say, original experience or something like that. And um, that's, I, I, I think that's, that. Uh, like I would, we would try to challenge that idea in, in, in just like talking about preference instead. That's, that's why I, I many of the times talked about like what kind of preference do people have? Because in the end, like you, when you make a recording, you also change a lot of uh, things on the way, like, like you, 
you actually take like a big three dimensional uh, sound space and you decompose it into two channels. So alone in that process, you just like um, took away a lot of the, let's say three dimensional information. If it was a, a shallow or something like that, which would have strings that radiate the sound and in, in one way, like this would have one directivity, the, the wooden parts would send the sound in another direction of the room and like it would just have like a lot of uh, special directivity uh, characteristics to it all that information is lost like when when you get it down to to a stereo track and on top of that like the the creator will will put a lot of processing on it too like of course some are very hardcore but even if they're hardcore you you lost a lot of things so I, I, th I think it's difficult to, to talk about pure reproduction unless we are talking ambisonic systems or, or like really uh, big setups with complicated microphone arrays and loudspeaker arrays. In terms of consumer loudspeakers, uh, stereo 5.1 and stuff like that, it, it's more um, creating an, ex an, an experience that, that, that people like, like that's, that's the target we're trying to hit. Like we will, we're looking to, to uh, achieve maximum preference, not, not trying to recreate um, what was there before it was decomposed. Okay, good. Um, another question here. Um, you mentioned using real-time measurements of driver voltage and current to drive the model's feedback loop. Is that sufficient or does the active speaker also need a microphone to measure actual generator sound during auto setup? Uh, yeah, so um, the loudspeaker does need a little bit more information than, than just the VNI measurements. Um, so, uh, and usually it's, it's, it can be difficult to achieve that later on. It's not impossible. It depends on what kind of transducers you have in the loudspeaker. But you can also uh, choose to like inject uh, that information in another stage, for example, in production. Okay, great. Mike Martindale has come back with another question. Um, you have focused on frequency domain measurements. Have you done time domain measurements to uncover resonances and other issues that can smear the sound? Yeah, we, we, we do look into that too. Um, the main focus on, on this, and, and I think we like, we, we do achieve quite a high degree of explanation between like the subjective world and the objective world, uh, not by ignoring it, but by paying attention to frequency domain stuff. So you can, you can argue that you could find a resonance that was not um, minimum phase, even though most would be. So if a, a resonance would be minimum phase, then it would show up in the frequency response. Like, like if you have a system that would actually ring uh, in the time domain, that ringing would also show up in the frequency domain. But you could maybe have some very special scenario where let's say a speaker would attenuate some other part that would ring and it wouldn't be a part of like that minimum phase system. And you would have to look for it in, in spectrograms or energy time decay plots or things like that, yeah. Um, just a bit of admin looks like the way that the webinar is set up um it's it, it's not possible to change uh your names on screen so apologies for that we'll try and um, do better next time um back to the questions um <laughs> anonymous attendees asking how significant is the performance gap between the cheapest and most expensive tvs <laughs> yeah so um it's it's significant um I, it's, it's difficult to, re, to, to, to kind of like put on a scale because also when you're talking these listening tests, you're usually using uh, references and you're using anchors to kind of like calibrate the scale because you're, you're always talking like how good this is this compared to something else. It's, it's very difficult to, to just like set a, a, a fixed scale. It's, it's kind of like floating around. And, and if you, let's say, you tested a lot of loudspeakers and you would find something that was much better or much worse than all the other loudspeakers you have in your data set you kind of like have to to recalibrate the scale again so it's, it's a difficult uh, question to answer but there's definitely a, a significant uh, difference yeah and 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 i guess um th there's a, a follow-up question to that so, so if, if we look at 
the mid-range models, whereabouts do they sit between the low end and the high end? Are they close to the top or bottom? Or oh yeah, so um, yeah, what, one thing we were we were finding when we were doing the the objective measurements on the TVs um, is that. Uh, they all kind of, at least the ones we tested, and I think we had a pretty good wide selection, um, they all kind of like suffer from the same problems. And uh, they don't suffer from the same kind of problems that most, let's say, not well rated uh, for firing loudspeakers suffer from, but they have, they have kind of like their own characteristics because they have the speakers usually on the back panel usually through a grill, uh, usually um, close to reflecting surfaces such as the back of the TV, uh, maybe even furniture is nearby and, and the sound undergoes uh, multiple very early reflections early on, which have kind of like imprints uh, um, kind of like a comp filter or uh, strong interference into the, to the signal and it's it's usually like a, a three-dimensional problem or a spatial problem. So you can't really uh, filter it away. You, you have to solve it um, in some other way. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. So we'll, we'll, we'll just uh, do a couple more questions and then I think we'll adjourn to the uh, meeting room, which I've just posted the link into the chat again. So ho hopefully everyone can at least read that. And uh, when we switch over, we can all go over to the meeting room and it should, fingers crossed, work a lot better and far fewer David Blake's. Um, so let's choose one more question. So um, a good one. Um, when the, the frequency perception of a person changes with their age, do you notice that in your listening tests? Um, so, so this is also something we looked into, um, and we especially looked into like other C research on this topic. Like I know uh, Haman, Sean Olive, and and some from from that team has has looked a lot into um, do do preference change, like how how subjective is preference, and they tested like different ages, different. Um, uh, countries, they tried to just like take listeners with a low amount of training, a high amount of training, and and there were differences, but the differences were quite small. Uh, they were small enough to to be able to set up a meaningful target that would kind of like satisfy uh, the waste majority of listeners. And and, and just as a, a follow up to that. Um... Who do you choose to do the blind listing test? Is it just Roku employees? Do you find people off the street or? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so. Who are your guinea pigs? Yeah, so so uh, the, the day I, was, I just presented was was from internal testing, uh, but, but we don't necessarily limit it to internal testing. Okay. Um... Great. Well, it's almost eight o'clock. So I think we'll bring the, uh, the, um, the sl slightly weirdly organized um, webinar. Uh, ap apologies about the, uh, the multiple David Blakes. I, I think that's, um, I'll, someone made a note for um, how to fix it for the IT future. I'll follow up with the, the one and only David Blake for that. Um, likewise, to obtain um, CPD certificates for IT members, um, I'm looking at it in the past, you registered through the IT website, so hopefully that will auto generate or you'll have um, a paper trail to show that you attended this evening's event. So um, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Casper for the, the his talk. Uh, I, I certainly got a lot out of it. Um, I've certainly learned a lot more about what goes on in, in the uh, to get speakers into TVs and what are um, what the Danish team is up to. So um, if we were live, we'd probably give a round of applause, but we'll just have to say um, to ourselves, thank you, Casper. And um, it just reminds me to say um, the link is in the chat for the um, uh, for the uh, the uh, Q and A. Um, Please copy the link now and we will step out of this. This webinar will close and then the new uh, Zoom meeting, hopefully 
we will have our own names but by then um we'll be open so thank you very much everyone to coming um it's been a pleasure hosting casper and hopefully see a lot of you on the other side thank you very much and good evening <laughs>